All right. A great crowd. How you doing? Anybody here for work? That's a nice job, huh? I've had 87 jobs in my lifetime. I know what you're thinking. That's an employable 30-year-old. 87 jobs. Only been fired from one job. But I was fired eight times from that one job. I was a 19-year-old kid. I worked in a store, and the owner of the store was a grumpy, bitter, sour old man. And for some reason, he just hated youth. Well, he hated this youth. Thankfully for me, his son was in charge of scheduling, so uh, he and I were buds. So I kept getting hours on the schedule, and the old man would fire me every single day. Got to be an abusive situation. He was really abusing his power. I mean, I'd show up for work, and he'd be like, hey! You're supposed to be here an hour ago. Where the hell were you? Well, how do you like to start work like that? God. I'd be like, I was a blockbuster. I had to return a movie. I didn't want to get a late fee. You know, what took you so long? Well, I had to watch the movie. <laughs> well, that don't matter to me. Today is your last day. You don't work here no more. And I'd be like, well, no, I'm on the schedule right there, 11 o'clock. Listen, i got to drop my girlfriend off somewhere. I won't get here till 11.30, but don't you worry. I'm not going to leave you short. <laughs> Next day, I'd show up at noon, and he'd be all angry again. What the hell are you doing? Today is your last day. You don't work here no more. Nope. Tomorrow. 10.30. I'm not going to leave you short. See you at noon. <laughs> that went on for a couple weeks. Finally, I had to quit because I didn't like the way I was being treated. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, look, it doesn't even work. <laughs> Thanks very much. In stand up comedy, that's called a bit. Several bits work together to form what's called a routine. Now, most stand up bits follow a similar format or structure, if you will. First off, a topic is introduced to the audience in the form of a premise. In this case, it was the workplace and this kid that gets fired repeatedly. In the setup, more details emerge, some characters are developed, and the conflict takes a little bit of a progression. And then finally, with the punchline, hopefully a humorous take on the expected happens and the audience laughs. And if that's the case, maybe some tags would be applied a little bit later where the comic adds another punch. In my case, for instance, I could say, I'm now suing for workplace harassment. <laughs> Some tags are better than others. Now, comedians have to marry the literary work and their performance art together in any stand-up comedy bit. And that can take months and it can take years, trying things out, rehearsing them, experimenting. And then finally, they get their bit to a place where it's workable. I first wrote a version of that bit in 1997, back when I was 30 years old. Now, I know what you're thinking, and thank you, you look great too. <laughs> and I performed a version of that bit in the early 2000s at a friend's cottage with a bunch of guests. And on the guest list was a working stand-up comic. I didn't know him, but he was a great guy, and we had a few laughs, and he loved my stuff. He was very complimentary, thought it was uh, really funny. And I believe him because a few months later, I saw him use my stuff on television. Now they say an imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, but I wasn't flattered. I was angry, bitter, upset. Don't worry, I added jealous later. <laughs> and I found out that many stand-up comics and artists in general feel the same way. They have these visceral reactions um, when they find that their work has been taken and used by somebody else. Now, I wasn't even a comic, full disclosure. I'm an actor, a Canadian actor, <laughs> which is its own cry for help, I suppose. <laughs> now, the bits weren't identical. There was a, a few changes. It's called a write-around in stand-up comedy. One comic will take a bit and change a couple of small portions of it, but in essence, a substantial portion of the original bit remains. And I thought that that's what happened to my work. 
So I decided to dig a little bit deeper and check. And over the years, I've discovered that this comic used no less than three of the bits that I performed that night at the cottage in television specials in Canada and the United States. So as a performer, my work was now out there, but my name wasn't attached to it. Now, fine, I'm not a comic, but I could have used that work in a different capacity. I also write comedy. It would have come in helpful. But it was out there. There's nothing I could do about it. I've been told to let it go. <laughs> friends of mine have told me let it go. Well, former friends. <laughs> Anybody who says let it go has never worked in television. In the entertainment business, having your name attached to your work is your career capital. It's credit. Credit is king. Your next job depends on the last job. And in my case, I was fired before I could even begin. Holy cow, I just got the irony of that. <laughs> and I'll be honest, it's tough to let it go when you come home and you see your 13-year-old son watching the television show created by the comic that used your work. I mean, come on. It's a good show. <laughs> what am I going to do, tell the kid he can't watch it? I told him he couldn't watch it. <laughs> but, but, but not because I was angry and jealous. It's because it's 4 o'clock in the afternoon. It's time to get to bed. <laughs> hey, teenagers need their sleep. Be good parents. <laughs> now, a quick Google search will show you instances of joke theft from famous comedians. Amy Schumer, Carlos Mencia, Trevor Noah even have all been accused of joke theft. You can Google it. And you'll find out that... Well, don't Google it now. <laughs> Wait till... You can watch Carlos Mencia perform a write-around of a Bill Cosby bit. You can see Louis C.K. get really upset at Dane Cook for stealing a bit that he wrote about naming his firstborn son in gibberish. And he's got a point. Louis C.K. did that bit before Dane Cook. Problem is, Steve Martin did it in the 1970s. And these are all famous stand-up comics. They don't need to worry about career capital. They've already had their success. The story we don't hear is when the joke gets stolen from the poor sap in Windsor doing an opening slot, and out of the five people in the audience, one of them is a stand-up comic looking for new material. Now, I know that's surprising, but there is comedy in Windsor. <laughs> now look, I know that this is just joke theft, right? I mean, I'm not naive. I don't even think it's on the top five list of world's pressing issues that need addressing right now. There's child poverty, there's climate change, there's... Oh, look at that, joke theft, number three. <laughs> Side note, I'm a teacher, that counts as research these days. <laughs> but why should you care? Why should you care where the comedy comes from? We all want to laugh, right? I want to laugh. Let me see if I can personalize this for you. Have you ever had a bicycle stolen out of your garage? Of course you have. We live in Winnipeg. That's, we call that Thursday. What if that bicycle that you made was made from scratch? You made it. Now, sure, it has the same form as other bikes, but you crafted this from the beginning, using pieces from appliances and household items, garbage, whatever you could find. And you found an interesting new way of putting those gears together and making them work. Maybe your brakes work telepathically. Maybe it could go underwater. Maybe there was a way for the tires to inflate themselves. Whatever it was, there was something unique about that bike. And before you could give it to the world, it was taken. But it wasn't just taken and sold on the local Kajai for a fraction of the cost. <laughs> The person who took it held it up on YouTube and said, click here, look what I created. Click here, take this bike for a spin. Click here, send it to your friends. And the clicks mounted. More and more and more clicks. It got shared on the Facebook and the Twitter. And before you know it, this bike was super popular. And the career capital of the person who crafted it went up and up and up. And meanwhile, you're still walking to work. Now, I know what you're thinking. God, that guy's arm is strong holding up a bike like that. <laughs>
you didn't have to laugh at that. I'll just say Winnipeg again, and you'll laugh at that. <laughs> but this is the thing. Many stand-up comedians don't feel like the originality of their bike, their joke, is protected by the Copyright Act. And so they've started protecting themselves in stand-up clubs. You can find one stand-up comic accuse another one right there on stage. Sometimes this turns violent. For me, this means that if I went to perform my bits from that night in the cabin at a comedy club, there's a good chance someone would come up and accuse me of joke theft. And that makes me hard, makes it hard to let it go. They'll edit that last part up. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what do you do? <laughs> what do I do? How do I let this go? I'm trying to be proactive. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get over it. I really am. I made some steps. The tender age of something, I went back to university. And I've spent the last five years completing my two year master's program <laughs> at the university, that's not funny, at the University of Lethbridge. Side note, the University of Lethbridge will let you do a master's program in anything, <laughs> studying stand up comedy and joke theft. And I also thought that maybe performing this story here for you today at this wonderful TED talk would be therapeutic for me in some way. Now, I know what you're thinking. That guy needs more expensive therapy. <laughs> Until I can afford that. I have some suggestions that might make the world of stand-up more stand-up. Cool, hey? <laughs> First, I think we should include stand-up comedy as its own form of dramatic work. Did you know that mime counts as its own form of dramatic work in the Canadian Copyright Act? That means that not just this stuff, but the written aspects of it and the performance aspects are thought together. And if that was applied to stand-up comedy, that would make a lot of sense. Because currently, separating the written word and the performance from the considerations for stand-up encourages the right around. And we want to discourage the right around. Second, we need to use holistic comparisons between artistic bits. Not just stand-up comedy, artistic bits. And the Canadian Copyright Act and, and our legal system has begun to do this. It's been shown that you do not have to break two comparable artistic works down into component parts. You can look at them holistically. That's good news for stand-up comics trying to protect their bike. Third, we should involve comedy artists in helping to shape and apply the law. I mean, they're the ones that have been, thanks, my idea. Copyright, Dave Brown, 2019. They're the ones that know what needs to be protected. Why don't we ask them? How about this? You could have a tribunal of comedians and legal scholars that could maybe provide a cost-effective way of dealing with cases of infringement before they even get to the courts. And let's face it, comics aren't suing anybody. Finally, comedy artists of all kinds, artists of all kinds, need to help each other create teach people that there's a difference between taking a substantial portion of a work and using it and taking an idea and making it your own, building on previous work. That's what artists need to do is build on previous work and we need to help each other create that work. Thank you. Thank you for that. I feel like we've shared something here. <laughs> and I don't share. I'm a selfish man. <laughs> Do me a favor, please. Continue to watch comedy. Continue to laugh. Enjoy it. But while you're laughing at a joke, please don't just assume that the joke you're listening to was created by the person telling it. If you can do that for me, I'll let it go. <laughs> I promise, I won't leave you short, thank you. <laughs>